Um, uh, yeah, I'm leading the team that's uh, porting our embedded controller implementation over to Zephyr. Um, if you saw Simon's great keynote talk this morning, I'm going to cover some of the same ground uh, he did, but I'm going to go into some more details about kind of what our whole process was um, and why we switched over to Zephyr. Uh, so for my agenda today, um, I'm going to talk about, you know, what is an embedded controller um, and, and talk more specifically why we made that switch to Zephyr. Uh, what our actual transition plan looked like to, to take a large uh, legacy code base and move it into Zephyr. And then finally, I'm going to cover um, our, our qualification criteria that we use uh, to ensure that Zephyr is going to be a successfully deployed on Chromebooks. So uh, before getting into the details of the embedded control itself, um, th this is a very simplified black diagram of a Chromebook. Uh, this is really just highlighting the main uh, processing components that are on a Chromebook. Uh, so in blue, uh, we've got the application processor, or AP, uh, and all its peripherals. Uh, you know, this is the workhorse in the Chromebook. Uh, it's, it's running on chips from uh, Intel, AMD, MediaTek, and Qualcomm are the ARM flavors uh, for our Chromebooks. Uh, the processor boots up through uh, the open source core boot firmware and it runs the Linux-based uh, Chrome OS operating system. Uh, Chromebook's minimum requirements are four gigabytes of RAM, 32 gigabytes of storage, plus eight megabytes of flash to store uh, the AP firmware. Uh, all Chromebooks also contain uh, our own Google security chip. Uh, the Google security chip is the foundation for Chromebook's hardware-based root of trust. Uh, it's part of our verified boot process uh, and I'll kind of keep our firmware images that run on both the EC and the AP. And finally, we've got the embedded controller. Uh, for Chromebooks, we require 512 kilobytes of flash, uh, 64 kilobytes of SRAM, and a core speed of at least 48 megahertz. And we require a lot of GPIOs. Uh, the GPIOs are used to enable uh, power rails to the main processor, uh, monitor those power good signals, service interrupts from uh, sensors, USB-C, integrated chips, um, and other devices. So taking a closer look uh, at the embedded controller, you, know, you see application itself runs on a small microcontroller. Uh, it's always powered up. Uh, it handles all the things you want the Chromebook to do, essentially when the main processor is off. Uh, the EC's first role after a full reset is powering up that main application processor. Uh, this involves turning on power rails in a specific sequence and with specific timings. Uh, and this varies, uh, these, this sequence and timings varies based off the, uh, the actual AP chipset. Uh, the EC also monitors signals that are coming back from the, uh, from the AP that communicate the AP's current power state. So if the AP decides to go into a suspend or sleep state, the EC is then responsible for waking the, uh, the whole system back up if the user interacts with the Chromebook. So this could be opening the lid, plugging in a, a charger, that sort of thing. Uh, for uh, keyboard scanning, um, the keyboard interface is managed as, as a matrix of rows and columns coming out of the EC. And the EC continuously scans, uh, reporting these key presses back to the operating system. For thermal management, the EC monitors temperatures um, of lots of components on the board. This could include the AP itself, uh, the RAM, charger chips. Um, and in the case of extreme temperatures, the EC can actually throttle uh, the AP uh, to, uh, to protect it, or we can completely shut down uh, the application processor. Um, and if there's active cooling in the system, the EC is also going to be responsible for managing the fans in, in a Chromebook. Uh, the sensor subsystem uh, calculates the lid angle uh, of a Chromebook, and this is done using two accelerometers, uh, one sitting in the base of the Chromebook and one in the lid. And then uh, by, by combining those two, we can basically create a virtual sensor that tells us the lid angle. And this is used to, to uh, cue to the uh, OS as to whether or not your, uh, your device is in a, in a laptop mode or if it's in tablet mode. Um, and, the, you know, and the sensor... In, Sensor subsystem also provides just kind of general orientation information, which can then be used by uh, gaming um, on your Chromebook. The, uh, 
the power subsystem includes a few different tasks. Uh, you know, we have to do all the battery uh, monitoring and charging. Uh, if there's USB-A ports on your system, the EC controls when power is applied to those ports and how much, uh, how much current we advertise that's available to the devices that you plug in. And then USB-C power delivery uh, is also completely managed by the EC. Um, uh, there's, there's actually two other talks uh, that are being presented by Google uh, that goes a lot more depth into uh, the USB-C power delivery. Uh, so one is tomorrow um, from uh, Diana. So I encourage you to, to uh, attend that one to get a kind of an introduction to USB-C. And then Sam also has a talk that kind of is a tutorial that shows you how to enable uh, USB-C sync capabilities in Zephyr. Um, and the last thing uh, we've got with our EC is we have a shell interface, uh, which we actually use for our, our own hardware testing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that more. Um, uh, on a shipping Chromebook, that shell is normally in a read-only mode, uh, but you actually can on, on just about any uh, Chromebook, uh, you can put it into an untrusted state called developer mode. And, uh, and then you can actually enable write access into that shell and interact with our EC. Uh, so Google created our own open source and better controller back in 2012. Uh, this implementation provides all the uh, typical RTOS services, uh, including thread scheduling, semaphores, mutexes, interrupts. Uh, to date, our original Chrome EC uh, has supported more than 200 Chromebook variants. Uh, you know, so why did Google uh, decide to switch to a new RTOS for our embedded controller? You know, we've been very happy with the, uh, the technical capabilities and features of our current solution. But we realize the industry really has seen our EC implementation as just being captive by Google. Um, there's been a limited amount of community contributors, uh, which has left Google to basically uh, have to implement all the features um, and do a lot of the driver development. And then our, our Google engineers spend a lot of time just doing board bring up work ourselves. Uh, the vendors that, that uh, work with us um, and provide chips that interact with the EC, uh, they have to write drivers specifically for Chromebooks. Um, this, this usually means that they have duplicated work, especially if they want to uh, capture markets other than Chromebooks. Um, so, you know, ultimately this limits the, uh, the number of devices and chipsets that we can qualify for use on Chromebooks. And, um, and as discussed in Simon's uh, keynote, you know, our long-term vision is to unify and have an industry standard EC that could support both Chrome OS and Windows. So Google evaluated you know, uh, several options for, for a new RTOS. Uh, and this included Zephyr, Free RTOS, and, and also Talk OS. Uh, we dismissed, dismissed Talk OS because their mission didn't really align with the embedded controller. Um, we also aren't ready to fully switch to Rust. And we, didn't, we, we saw that it was gonna be an uphill battle to get chip vendors and manufacturers to also start coding in Rust. Uh, the choice between free RTOS and Zephyr really came down to the, uh, the community around Zephyr. Uh, you know, it's apparent that Zephyr's community is very engaged and passionate about the mission. And, you know, seeing contributions by these large chip makers, NXP, Intel, Nordic, you know, helped convince us Zephyr was here to stay. Um, you know, as I was creating this presentation uh, and, and reviewing kind of our decision making, I came across a great quote uh, that I want to share. Um, Many things feel like Linux. Zephyr is a Linux foundation project for a reason. Um, so I, I've kind of actually lost who actually said that quote, but I, I think it really kind of highlights, you know, what, what the relationship of the Linux foundation is um, to engaging and getting more people signed up uh, onto Zephyr. You know, uh, Zephyr's neutral governance uh, is a great, another great thing in, in the toolbox that encourages more participation from the community. It's not just one company driving the technical vision. Um, you know, and with that, we see uh, it's, it's easier for more chip vendors, EC chip vendors and peripheral vendors to, uh, uh, to add their code to Zephyr. And, and we've, we've already gotten uh, Nubaton, ITE, and Microchip 
to start act actively contributing their driver designs uh, into Zephyr. And then on the technical side, you know, with our own implementation, we never had the time to make a, a better, uh, more robust configuration framework. So that's really attractive that Zephyr has, you know, these, these industry standard K-config and device tree to come forward, uh, configure all the boards. And, and then finally, you know, the memory protection model of Zephyr is something we want to explore. Um, although we're not currently using the, uh, the user model or the user space in our EC application. So Google plans to be a major contributor to Zephyr. Building on our experience with the uh, Linux and Core Boot communities, you know, Google embraces the upstream first philosophy and we plan to upstream all our EC features. You know, so we've already landed our state machine framework library uh, this library is used by our USB-C power delivery stack, and it's also used by the application process of power sequencing. The upstreaming of our USB-C power delivery stack is in progress. Uh, the full stack includes support uh, for both syncing and sourcing power on the USB-C connection. And we can also configure uh, all the uh, alternate modes. Uh, this includes DisplayPort and USB 4. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have two other talks uh, specifically on USB-C. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, find those on the schedule and uh, attend those. Uh, Google is also working with Intel to design a new sensor framework into Zephyr right now. Um, Android's Context Runtime Environment, or CHRE, uh, has been approved to be part of the solution. It won't be a required uh, component, uh, but it is, it is something that can be uh, leveraged. Um, uh, there's, I think it's already been recorded. Uh, Yuval from Google um, has a talk that talks more about the, uh, uh, the new sensor framework and the roadmap that we see with that. And then uh, Google, uh, we're also working with Intel uh, to shed the techn technical debt around our application processor power sequencing. Uh, so we've been redesigning the AP power sequencing uh, from the ground up to use uh, Zephyr's device model. So our EC application is feature rich, but we couldn't lose functionality or introduce regressions during this transition to Zephyr. So to reuse as much code as possible, we created a shim layer. Um, you know, so the shim layer really just serves to translate all our existing APIs into Zephyr's APIs. You know, so for kernel services, there's really just a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, that, that, was, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, for device drivers, we didn't have a very good or uh, consistent configuration model, uh, but we were able to use the shim layer uh, to actually get configured by device tree. And, and with this, we were able to lem eliminate a lot of the custom code that we are creating uh, for each board uh, and for each Chromebook variant. And so these driver shims, you know, connect directly into Zephyr's uh, driver API. And then in turn, we're using the, uh, the, uh, the, the low-level drivers that are provided by the SOC vendor. And, you know, in this whole system, if we had name conflicts, we had to change, we had to change our API name as opposed to trying to make Zephyr change their name. And that, uh, that got everything working. And our existing EC code, you know, we configure through a really large list of pound defines, uh, and, but it was very straightforward to uh, convert that model over to using kconfigs. So uh, the diagram on the right uh, shows the relationship of the repositories that we're using to build Zephyr. Uh, so Google mirrors the upstream Zephyr repositories uh, into our Chromium source. Um, and then we also have our existing EC code is in a separate repository called Platform EC. To build Zephyr EC images, the build tools compile and link code from uh, both the mirrored Zephyr repositories and our existing platform EC repository. And the platform EC repository is where, we're con is where uh, we placed all our board projects and our shim code. And so when building a full Kermos image, you know, our portage package manager uh, uses, uses an e-build to, to pick up and configure the correct repositories and build that EC binary. And then for local builds, um, 
we can build it directly using our own meta tool called ZMake. Um, uh, West uh, ultimately was uh, created based off repo. Uh, within our Chromium uh, repository, we already have repo. Uh, so that was a duplication of work right now. And there's some other capabilities of West uh, that it doesn't have right now. We do hope to extend West to support all our use cases here as we move forward. Uh, so here's a timeline for how Google transitioned from the legacy EC uh, to a Zephyr-based EC. At the start of 2021, uh, we started with the proof of concept code uh, targeting the Chromebook platform based off an Intel Tiger Lake processor. Uh, we later expanded support to designs based on Qualcomm and MediaTek processors. And then the Zephyr EC code is running on chipsets from Nubaton and ITE. So based off our successful qualification testing, uh, Google committed to switching all new Chromebook designs over to Zephyr. Uh, to date, we've successfully done board brain up on four separate projects, and those targeting all the, um, all the main application uh, processor families supported by Chromebooks today. And for the next phase of work in 2022 and beyond, uh, we're gonna be moving all, all these EC features upstream into the Zephyr main tree. Uh, Google's current EC firmware qualification relies on a lot of hardware testing. Uh, for our new Zephyr EC application, the external APIs were unchanged, which ensured all, all our existing tooling could work with our legacy code and the Zephyr EC application. This also means we didn't have to cha make changes to the application processor uh, firmware or to the Linux kernel drivers that can communicate directly with the EC. Our hardware testing is built on top of our uh, closed case debug capability, um, also called CCD. Uh, this is a feature of the Google security chip that uses the, uh, the sideband signals of the USB-C connection to expose the consoles to the application processor and the EC. The orange Suzy Q cable on the right uh, simply connects to a USB-A port on your host, on your host computer and then the type C end connects uh, into the Chromebook. In our labs, we use a fancier version called Servo V4, uh, which also provides a network connection uh, and a USB driver for loading new Chrome OS images. The automated firmware tests use both the CD CCD connection and an SSH connection into the Chrome OS kernel, and we inject commands and then verify responses. Uh, the Servo V4 also includes USB see power delivery support, and those capabilities can be scripted up, which provides additional test coverage on the actual hardware. So uh, beyond running our existing tests and suites, the two main metrics we, uh, we had to check when switching over to Zephyr uh, was the power consumption and the image size. The power consumption of the EC running, uh, on the, um, running under Zephyr we measured and, and basically match what we saw with our legacy code. So for Chromebooks, our requirement is that the EC has to consume less than 10 milliwatts of power uh, when it's in one of its sleep modes, uh, but then less than five milliwatts of power is, is actually desired. So our Zephyr EC images um, are larger than our custom, uh, our custom RTOS implementation, but that hasn't changed our minimum requirements for the microcontroller. So this ensures that uh, we haven't increased the bill of materials cost uh, for Chromebooks just because we want to switch over to Zephyr. So as part of switching to Zephyr, uh, Google is greatly expanding the level of our testing and code coverage uh, for the EC. And, and really our goal here is to get to this, uh, uh, this effort of being hardware free testing. Uh, our tests are split into uh, two categories. We have driver tests uh, to validate API, uh, and they, these use an emulator to simulate the real hardware. The goal of the driver tests is to ensure every single line of code is tested, uh, and we track this all in GitHub. The integration tests are used to verify high-level functionality of the EC. One example we have is a USB-C charger test that validates all the steps of connecting a charger to a Chromebook. So this includes performing power delivery negotiation, 
uh, with that amyloidal charger. We verify the voltage levels, uh, and then we verify that an amyloidal battery also starts accepting current. The integration tests overall don't provide as much code coverage as, as the driver tests, but they're better for verifying bug fixes that we find on real hardware. We've created emulators for devices connected to the EC chip. Uh, because so many peripherals connect over an I2C bus, we first created an emulator for an I2C controller uh, that has been upstreamed. Uh, uh, this, this emulator can support multiple emulated I2C targets, uh, including devices such as charger chips, batteries, and sensors. The USB-C power delivery partner emulates both source and sync capabilities. And this emulator also supports uh, all the needed power delivery messages to enter alternate modes. So we're using GitLab to automatically run all these hardware free tests and to generate our code coverage reports. All these tests, uh, all these results and coverage reports are available publicly from this link here on GitLab. And we plan to have an integration suite that matches every board configuration. Uh, this will ensure that we have test coverage for all the combinations of chips and peripherals that are deployed on, on shipping Chromebooks. Um, uh, later today, you all is giving a talk during the uh, test framework um, uh, that he's going to talk a little bit more about our emulator and test strategy. So I, I, I've learned the hard way, right, not to try to do live demos during a presentation. Uh, so I've captured just a very quick um, uh, screenshot of the Zephyr EC application booting up um, on, on a Chromebook. Actually, it's a uh, Chromebook here. I, I'm going to bring it out of the bag here, just kind of show it off. Uh, so during this boot, you know, we don't have any charges connected to the Chromebook. So the EC has to check uh, the battery health, make sure there's enough capacity to actually power up the system. Uh, everything looks good. So we powered up the AP, get all the way to the uh, zero state, and then we power up sensors and start reporting all that data um, up to the operating system. Um, in, in this, uh, 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 with debug, extra debug code, the, the boot process slows up, uh, but on a shipping Chromebook, uh, with the, uh, the AP firmware cor configured correctly, we boot up in less than 10 seconds. Um, so I did bring, uh, with me, um, this is actually the first, uh, uh very much prototype, as you can see in the fancy clear acrylics, uh, Chromebook that's going to be running the Zephyr EC. So this is a, um, a reference board uh, from Google, and then our partners uh, take this reference design and we'll, we'll turn this into a product that you'll see um, out in the field. Uh, this is running off a, a Qualcomm uh, application processor, and uh, that's it. So yeah, if, uh, after the talk, if you wanna take a little closer look at it, uh, come up and see me. Um, and then I think, yeah, that's it. So other questions? Um, uh, yeah, Greg? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the question was in porting over uh, to new RTOS, uh, how do we manage the inner priorities? Um, so uh, in our case, actually, we could largely uh, leverage the uh, the uh, EC SOC chip vendor for that. Um, you know, so uh, most of the interrupts that we're servicing were all just uh, uh, GPIO interrupts, um, just reg regular old pin interrupts. And then for all the peripherals on the chip, uh, we could let the EC vendor um, manage all that and and make that work under Zephyr's model. Oh, so for thread priorities, actually I actually have a slide on that. Um, so uh, yeah, so these are all the threads uh, that we have on a Zephyr EC application. So you know we we already had our own thread priorities, so we were able to basically just kind of map these over into Zephyr and make sure we set these up at the same priorities. Uh, yes, Chris. Yeah. Um, the first is um, maybe everyone is wondering about how can I buy that Chromebook with the Qualcomm processor, but Zephyr EC. I'm sure. That's yeah. Uh, so the first question is, uh, when when can you buy this Chromebook that's got a Qualcomm processor? And that's proprietary. So yeah, I can't can't divulge that information. Uh, the emulated iSource EC peripherals are available for free. Uh, 
are those also just configured with device tree as if it were real hardware? So the question is, are the emulator peripherals configured with device tree? And the answer is yes. So uh, our goal uh, with that uh, we're, uh, is, I think I think we can move things in a direction where we can hopefully use the same device tree that's used on an actual board and then use it also with the emulated system. Uh, yes. Uh, so the question is, are we using Zephyr's power managing? management capabilities? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we are enabling uh, the, uh, the config PM option under Zephyr. And, uh, and that's basically used to uh, signal to the, uh, to the uh, embedded controller when it can go into a sleep mode um, and, and go into its lowest power state. Uh, yes, Marty. Yeah. Uh, so the question is if uh, if we've noticed uh, runtime differences between Zephyr and our custom solution. Uh, so to date, I'd say the the main thing we've seen is uh, we have to work with the uh, the EC chip vendors to make sure that their drivers, especially sent around the ITC bus, are performing at the same level uh, that they were in our, in our custom solution. Um, for USB power delivery, uh, communicating with those uh, those chips over ITC is really critical to meeting uh, those timings. Um, I think, yeah, there was a question here. Yeah, uh, I assume the application processor has the capability to flash the embedded controller? Uh, the question is, does the application processor have the ability to flash the embedded controller? Um, yes. So our embedded controller uh, is actually uh, deployed our, our images are deployed as a read-only portion and a read-write portion. Um, so when there's determined that a firmware update is required, the uh, the embedding controller is forced back into its read-only image. Um, and then actually the uh, the firmware on the running on the application processor will initiate the firmware update of the read-write portion, and then we'll jump to that and start running with that new firmware. The follow-up question is like, uh, what is the benefit of having the lock permanently turned on of the shell? Is, uh, in comparison to just enabling it in case there's some debugging needed to reduce the flash size or? Uh, so the question is um, uh, the, the, the need for locking the, uh, the UART shell to the, to the uh, uh, EC console. And, and actually the answer is that lock is actually controlled by the Google security chip. So there's no impact to the EC firmware size um, uh, for managing that. Uh, yes. Um, not for ITC directly. Oh, so the question is, are, are we developing any tests to kind of characterize an ITC bus and performance of an ITC bus? Um, and so the answer is not directly, but what we are looking at doing as um, is we, we are looking at upstreaming basically USB-C compliance tests. And one component of those compliance tests is meeting certain minimum timings uh, between receiving messages and responding on that interface. Okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, will the, I guess, will the community be able to customize EC firmware uh, on Chromebooks using Zephyr? And uh, yes, the long-term uh, long answer to that is yes. Uh, we have some work to upstream it. I mean, you could you could build all this stuff now um, using the same uh, using the same Chromium repositories and Zephyr and kind of combine this together. But it's obviously pretty complicated. So our long term version is that you are going to be able to build uh, Zephyr EC images directly from the Zephyr tree and probably a a, a couple extra modules. Uh, yes, there's a question here. Uh, yes, I, I I read somewhere that. Uh... Windows 11 is preventing the, the new manufacturers from like, being able to load Linux into a machine. What about you guys? Will I be able to install Linux on your machine? 
Um, so the question is, uh, is, is Google and Chromebooks limiting, uh, I guess, the, uh, the operating system that you can put onto, onto your hardware? And the answer is no. And especially asking about Linux specifically, you know, Chromebooks are Linux. Um, um, but uh, yeah, the, the Chromebook platform itself is really meant to be not only open source, but open kind of an open hardware platform. Um, so that's the reason why you can take a, a shipping Chromebook and you can put it into developer mode. You can remove the write protection and you can put your own firmware um, on the EC onto the, the main processor and replace that bias. All right, so yeah, well, I think uh, we're out of time here. Okay, so I'll take one more question. Yeah, there's, uh, so the question is if we're going to upstream our shell interface. So we're, we're already using Zephyr shell in our EC application. It's just the, the connection, basically, basically the locking that we do for the shell interface is actually at the hardware level. So the Google security chip intercepts the uh, transmit line coming into the, uh, the embedded controller's UART interface, and, and it just blocks it. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, everybody.